Okay, we're on Exodus 28. And we've seen that the articles of the furniture, both inside and outside the tabernacle, all speak of Yeshua Messiah. Also, the materials of the construction of the tabernacle all point to the person and work of our Messiah. Now we're going to see that the garments of the high priest speak of Messiah also. Let's take a look at verse 1 of Exodus 28. We read, Then bring near to yourself Aaron your brother and his sons with him from among the sons of Israel to minister as priests to me, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar, Aaron's sons. Now Aaron was made high priest. His sons were made priests also. They were uh, called to a high order of service to Elohim. Now, we're, we were told, and we talked about this in Hebrews, that Yeshua, Messiah, is a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, or Melchizedek. That's in Hebrews 7, starting at verse 11. Now, if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, for on, at the, base, for on the basis of it, the people received the Torah, what further need was there for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek, and not be designated according to the order of Aaron. For when the priesthood is changed, of necessity there takes place a change of the law also. And that word for changed is actually better uh, translated transferred. For the one concerning whom these things are spoken of belongs to another tribe from which no one has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Adonai was descended from Judah, a tribe with reference to which Moses spoke nothing concerning priests. And this is clearer still if another priest arises according to the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become such not on the basis of Torah, physical requirement, but according to the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And that comes from the Psalms. Now, this guy, Melchizedek, he is in uh, he appears in Genesis 14, starting at verse 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of Elohim Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of Elohim Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be Elohim Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tenth of all. Now, uh, Melchizedek is, uh, is referred to in the book of Genesis as a man who met Abraham and was called the priest of the Most High Elohim. It's very interesting that uh, Melchizedek is, is referred to as a priest of Elohim, and he came with bread and wine. I thought that was interesting. Yeshua executes his priestly office after the pattern here that's given to Aaron. <clears throat> now, the sons of Aaron are priests also. They assisted the, the uh, high priest in his duties. So look at verse 2 of Exodus 28. You shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother for glory and for beauty. Okay, now this last half of the book of Exodus, it doesn't give us much in the way of thrilling action and mystery. Okay? It's, uh, it gives instructions that seem to be somewhat dull. However, close inspection shows that these things point toward uh, to Messiah. And that's one reason why they're important for us today. Now, Scripture here uses instruction, and it paints pictures for us. Scripture is often, it's, it's a picture book, which uses symbols, and Elohim wants, wants us to learn the truths that he has for us by looking at these pictures. The garments of the high priest are, are holy. And what does that mean again? Set apart. Set apart. It's, for, it's for use in service to Elohim only. It's a set-apart thing. These articles were for the glory of Elohim and were beautiful. Let's look at verse 3. And you shall speak to all the skillful persons who, whom I have endowed with the spirit of wisdom, that they make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister as a priest to me. So Aaron is set aside for the work of serving Elohim. And he says Elohim has, uh, he says he's endowed, endowed a spirit of wisdom on certain people that have the skill to do these tasks. And apparently he's, he's, uh, he, he's imputed on their mind what he wants out of them. Elohim. Right, and from these vague descriptions we see, that's not, they went by more than that. 
uh, there were details in their minds that Elohim gave, gave these, these people. Verses 4 and 5. And these are the garments which they shall make, a breastpiece, and an ephod, and a robe, and a tunic of checkered work, a turban, and a sash, and they shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother and his sons, that he may minister as priest to me. And they shall take the gold and the blue and the purple and the scarlet material and the fine linen. Now there, uh, there are six items that comprise the high priest's garments. And the first is the ephod. Verse 6. They shall also make the ephod of gold, of blue and purple scarlet, and, uh, scarlet material and fine twisted linen, the work of the skillful workmen. It shall have two shoulder pieces joined to its two ends, that it may be joined. And the skillfully woven band which is on it shall be like its workmanship of the same material, of gold, of blue and purple, and scarlet material, and fine twisted linen. Verse 9, you shall take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel, six of their names on one stone, and the names of the rem remaining six on the other stone, according to their birth. As a jeweler engraves a signet, you shall engrave the two stones according to the names of the sons of Israel. You shall set them in filigree settings of gold. Now, this, uh, this ephod, is, uh, it's a kind of uh, a vest consisting of two pieces. One to cover the chest and the other to cover the back, joined by a seam at the shoulder and by a band at the waist. Each shoulder, on each shoulder here was placed a precious stone and it inscribed, uh, inscribed on it with six uh, names of the six of the tribes on each one. In verse 12, And you shall put the two stones on the shoulder pieces of the ephod as stones of memorial for the sons of Israel, and Aaron shall bear their names before Yahweh on his two shoulders for a memorial. So when the high priest goes into the Holy of Holies to Elohim on, the, on Yom Kippur, he was carrying the names of the 12 tribes on his shoulders. This speaks of the power and strength of the high priest in his representation of the people before Elohim. And Yeshua now is our high priest. He is our mediator to Elohim and beseeches him on our behalf. And the, the ephod speaks of the power and strength of Messiah also to save us. Verse 13. And you shall make filigree settings of gold, and two chains of pure gold you shall make them of twisted cordage work, and you shall put the corded chains on the filigree settings. And you shall make a breastpiece of judgment, the work of a skillful workman, like the work of the ephod you shall make, make it, of gold, of blue and purple and scarlet material, and fine twisted linen, you shall make it. It shall be square and folded double, a span in length and a span in width. Now, the breastplate was the most striking and brilliant object out of the whole attire. It was tied to the shoulders by gold chains and set with 12 stones, which were engraved... Uh, had engraved on them the names of Israel, of all the, all the tribes. <clears throat> uh, yeah, they're, they're going to be the same. We'll, uh, we'll get to that, actually, just a little bit. Verse 17, you shall mount on it four rows of stones. The first row shall be a row of ruby, topaz, and emerald. The second row, a turquoise, a sapphire, and a diamond. The third row, a jacinth, and a gate, and an amethyst. The fourth row, a beryl, and an onyx, and a jasper. that shall be set in gold filigree. The breastplate is to be worn when the high priest walks into the Holy of Holies with, within, uh, which is in the presence of Elohim himself. This breastplate speaks of all the tribes of Israel. The same 12 stones with the names of the 12 tribes of Israel also speak of the foundation of the city of New Jerusalem. Now, we're going to take a look at that. New Jerusalem, as described in Revelation, and keep in mind, Revelation is very symbolic. Okay, New Jerusalem is a picture of redeemed Israel. It's not, there's not really going to be a materialistic big cube city come down, okay? This is how Elohim sees his redeemed people. 
and I'm going to uh, show you this in particular. Look at verse 21 first. Um, and the stones shall be according to the names of the sons of Israel, twelve according to their names. They shall be like the engravings of a seal, each according to his name for the twelve tribes. Now, in Revelation 21, starting at verse 9, and once again, John just tells you what he sees and what he hears. We read in verse 9, And one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I'll show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Now, who is this, uh, this angel? What's he going to show him? The bride. Israel. Redeemed Israel. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from Elohim. So he's going to show a representation of redeemed Israel here. Verse 11, having the glory of Elohim, her brilliance was like a very costly stone, as the, a stone of crystal clear jasper. And it had a great and high wall with twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels. And names were written on them, which are those of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel. Interesting. Just like the breastplate, eh? We have uh, these twelve gates, and... Inscribed on them are the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had twelve foundation stones. And on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Um, and in a, in a symbolic way, remember when Yeshua told Peter, and upon you I'll build the assembly? Well, that's what he's referencing to, this type of thing. It had a great and high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates 12 angels, and names were written on them, which are those of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. Now, was, uh, looking at 12 and 13 again. These are the three gates, uh, three gates on the east, three in the north, three in the south, and three gates on the west. Now, looking back at verse 21, of Exodus 28, the stones shall be according to the names of the sons of Israel, twelve according to their names, they shall be like the engravings of a seal, each according to his name for the twelve tribes. Going back to Revelation 21, verse 15, and the one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its wall. And the city is laid out as a square, its length is as great as the width. And he measured the city with a rod. What else is this, uh, made in a square? Its length and its width are the same thing. Let me give you a hint. Breastplate, yeah. He measured the city with a rod 1,500 miles. Its length and its width and height are equal. Um, and he measured its wall 72 yards. Actually, you know, uh, the New American Standard translated these distances for us and put it in distances that we can relate to, all right? Uh, it actually was not in 1,500 miles. That's not what it says in the original. Uh, what does somebody, well, you don't need to look at it. I'll tell you what it says. Uh, 12,000 stadia. Okay, what's a stadia? Eighth of a mile. Yeah, it's a furlong, right. Right. And according to its walls, we, they wrote 72 yards, but it says 144 cubits. Okay? There's two cubits in a yard. According to human measurements, which are measurements which are also angelic measurements. Okay, so we have this city. Its, its length and its width and its, its height are 12,000 stadia. Uh, what is 12 a reference to? Every time in Scripture. T symbolic reference to Israel. Always. 144, interesting number. How do you, what do you multiply to get 144? 12 times 12. Uh, see the picture so far? And this is, I mean, people have, have gone to great lengths to try and figure out what this means, and it's not that difficult. <clears throat> the city's laid out as a square, it says in fixed it. I have the 12,000 stadia here. And if you look at... Uh, Exodus 28, verses 15 and 16, shall make a breastpiece of judgment. 
The work of a skillful workman, like the work of the ephod, you shall make it of gold, of blue and purple scarlet material, finely twisted linen, you shall make it, it shall be square. And folded double, a span in length and a span in width. And if you look at these <laughs> uh, different precious stones here, now you're going with a language difference, okay, and a culture difference. And uh, so you have to, I had to look up what these were. In Revelation 21, starting at verse 19, the foundation stones of the city wall were adorned with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation stone was jasper, the second sapphire, the third uh, chalcedony. Uh, you say chalcedony, I say quartz. The fourth emerald, the fifth uh, 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 sardonyx. You say sardonyx, I say onyx. The sixth, sardius, that's a ruby. The seventh, chrysolite, transparent gold yellow, that's a, really a diamond. The eighth, beryl, the ninth, topaz, the tenth, uh, chrysoprase, that's turquoise. The eleventh, jacinth, the twelfth, amethyst, same list. Same list. Any questions on that so far? <clears throat> and verse 22, you shall make the breastpiece chains of twisted cordage work in pure gold. And Revelation 21, verse 21, of the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each of the 12 gates was a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. So you see, uh, Revelation, this new, new Jerusalem in Revelation, is a picture of redeemed Israel, how he sees his redeemed people. Okay? It's a beautiful picture is what he sees. <clears throat> Any thoughts on that before we move on? Nope. Nope. See, those numbers always mean a lot. I found that out. Those numbers in Scripture, you know, it says 1,500 miles. What? That's, let's see, 1,500 divided by 12, that didn't work. So I looked it, looked it up. Oh, 12,000 stadia. Now it's obvious. <laughs> okay. They're just trying to help us. Verse 23 of Exodus 28. And you shall make on the breastpiece two rings of gold, and shall put the two rings on the two ends of the breastpiece. And you shall put the two cords of gold on the two rings at the ends of the breastpiece. You shall put the other two ends of the two cords on the two filigree settings, and put them on the shoulder pieces of the ephod at the front of it. And you shall make two rings of gold and shall place them on two ends of the breastpiece on the edge of it, which is toward the inner side of the ephod. And you shall make two rings of gold and put them on the bottom of the two shoulder pieces of the ephod, on the front of it, close to the place where it's joined above the skillfully woven band of the ephod. And they shall bind the breastpiece by its rings to the rings of the ephod with a blue cord, that it may be skillfully maybe on the skillfully woven band of the ephod, and that the breastpiece may not come loose from the ephod. And Aaron shall carry the names of the sons of Israel and the breastpiece of the judgment over his heart when he enters the holy place for a memorial before Yahweh continually. And you shall put in the breastpiece of judgment the Urim and the Thummim. And they shall be over Aaron's heart and when he goes in before Yahweh, and Aaron shall carry the judgment of the sons of Israel over his heart before Yahweh continually. Okay, um, the Urim and the Thummim. Now, most scholars say the words stand for lights and perfection, or true instruction. They were kept in the breastplate, and apparently Elohim used them to give the high priest yes or no answers to questions. Uh, we're giving absolutely no details as to what the Urim and the Thummim look like. Why is that? Be selling them at Walmart. That's right. Yep. Yep. Be like that uh, magic eight ball. Try again. Verse 31, you shall make the robe of the ephod all of blue, and there shall be an opening at its top in the middle of it. Around its opening there shall be a binding of woven work, as it were the opening of the coat of mail, that it may not be torn. 
And you shall make it on its hem pomegranates of blue and purple and scarlet material. All around it on its hem, and bells of gold between them all around, a golden bell and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate all around the hem of the robe. Yeah. No, I didn't know that. That's interesting. There are 613 seeds. And the pomegranate has 613 seeds in it. Yeah, 613. That's, that's what she's... That was excellent, Cherry. Now, uh, pomegranates speak of fruit. And uh, what's, what's fruit symbolic of? Works. Or works. That sure fits what you said. Uh, bells speak of, a, of witness. You know, we're to be witnesses of Torah and Messiah, and we should have the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. We should have a life of obeying Torah through the fruits of the Spirit to back up our witness. We need a bell and a pomegranate, and a bell and a pomegranate. Verse 35, And it shall be on Aaron when he ministers, and its tinkling may be heard when he enters and leaves the holy place before Yahweh that he may not die. I wish they'd said ringing instead of, well, anyway. When Aaron was in the holy place in the Holy of Holies, serving Elohim, they, they could hear him in there. The bells would be ringing, okay? He was there to work, not to take a nap. And if the people couldn't hear the sounds of the service, that likely meant he was dead. Verse 36, and you shall also make a plate of pure gold and shall engrave on it like the engravings of a seal, holy to Yahweh, set apart for Yahweh. The high priest in the, the gold plate fastened to his head with the engraving holy to Yahweh. See, in the same way, those who are set apart for Elohim uh, are a part of the city of Jerusalem, New Jerusalem. In uh, Revelation 21, going back to that, verse 25, in, in the daytime, for there shall be no night there, its gates shall never be closed, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it, and nothing unclean, and no one who practices an abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. <clears throat> verse 37, And you shall fasten it on a blue cord, and it shall be on the turban, it shall be at the front of the turban, and it shall be on Aaron's forehead, and Aaron shall take away the iniquity of the holy things which the sons of Israel consecrate. With regard to all their holy gifts, it shall always be on his forehead, that they may be accepted before Yahweh. And you shall weave the tunic of checkered work of fine linen, and you shall make a turban of fine linen. You shall make a sash, the work of a weaver. Now, these garments distinguished Aaron from the other priests, Okay? The other priest didn't wear the ephod and the, the turban like that uh, with, the, with the name on it. What, uh, they, they just dressed in white, okay, in white linen. So you can tell between the high priest and the normal priest. Let's take a look at what the normal priest wears. Verse 40, and for Aaron's sons, you shall make tunics. You shall also make sashes for them. You shall make caps for them for glory and for beauty. You shall put them on Aaron, your brother, and his, on his sons with him. And you shall anoint them and orda uh, ordain them and consecrate them that they may serve me as priests. And you shall, cover, or shall make, them, uh, make for them linen breeches to cover their bare flesh. And they shall reach from the loins even to the thighs. And they shall be on Aaron and on his sons when they enter the tent of meeting or when they approach the altar to minister in the holy place so that they do not incur guilt and die. It shall be a statute forever to him and to his descendants after him. So Elohim wants his priest dressed in white linen and sashes. You know, this is an interesting thing. Scripture says that we will be his priests. He wants a nation of priests. In 1 Peter 2, verse 9, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for Elohim's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. Um, seeing his bride in Revelation. 
Interestingly enough, in, Re in Revelation 19, verse 14, And the armies which are in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. So you see these things, it, you see how Scripture is a pic picture book for us. It really is. This, and we talk about the symbols in Scripture and how important they are to understand and how they relate to us. And there's another part that I, I should have put in here and I didn't. Um, it is in uh, Ezekiel chapter 28, I do believe. Won't be long, I'll need longer arms. Now this uh, king of Tyre, and people think, by the way, in, in, in Ezekiel 28, they think this is a, uh, the account of Satan uh, rebelling uh, out of pride against Elohim. That's not what this is. This is a, this, Satan didn't rebel, okay? Satan just doing what Satan was created to do. This, this in chapter 28, it's about the uh, king of Tyre. And it's, it talks, it uses, it, once again, it uses, uh, it uses symbolism to tell us things. It tells him, for instance, that he was in Eden. All right, king of Tyre was in Eden. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means he was Satan himself and he was in the Garden of Eden. No, no, no. No, it means he was in the most beautiful place and had everything. The king of Tyre did. Tyre was the richest city in the world and he was king of it. All Mediterranean trade went through Tyre, okay? And the king makes sure he got his, his little bit every time. And it says here, um, again, the word of Yahweh came to me saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says Adonai Yahweh. This is verse uh, 12. You had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of Elohim. Every precious stone was your covering, the ruby, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, the lapis lazuli, the turquoise, the emerald, and the gold. What are those 12 stones? It's the same 12 stones. What did he call it? You had the seal of perfection. That's what he sees. That's what Elohim sees when he sees his redeemed people. Okay, when, when you know, there's, there's going to be a time there's a judgment. And we're going to be judged. And what he's been doing is writing his Torah on our hearts and on our minds. Right? So when he looks at us, when he looks at his people, and he looks at our heart, what's he going to see? His Torah. What's he going to say? Well done, my good and faithful servant. 